I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. G'day, guys. And we've got our very first repeat offender. Welcome back, <laughs> Dr. Aaron Caymans. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so paleontologist from Flinders University, and... Um, We've had a lot of feedback about uh, when we had you on the show last time. A lot of people really, really enjoyed it. So, great. Um, I'm glad they enjoyed great. it. Yeah, yeah, great to have you back. And um, you've just been involved in a paper that's just been released on Thylacoleo, yep. the marsupial lion. What a cool sounding animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not actually a lion at all, it's more closely related to wombats and koalas. Um, but in terms of the niche that it filled within the Australian environment, we refer to it as the marsupial lion because that allows people to imagine the function it was performing in our ecosystems as the top mammal predator. Right, and you say it's related to, to wombats and koalas, but it was what we can tell, well, what you can tell, it was a, um, a carnivore. Yeah, so it's actually really special in that regard. There's not really anything like it in any other groups of mammals because it is a, a, a carnivore that's evolved from herbivorous stock. So if you look at the placental mammals, the, all of the uh, carnivorans, the carnivores, are in one group essentially, whereas when we look at thylacoleo, it's in, evolved in a group called the diprotodontia. So there are all of the wombats, the koalas, the kangaroos, the possums, that whole group, and this is the only lineage that's actually evolved towards hypercarnivory. Right. Now, the diprotodontia, that's the two lower incisors. Yes. So they're recognisable by their two front teeth. Okay. So that's yep. everything except for the bandicoots and bilbies and the dasyurids. Yep. And probably some extinct things. And, and the marsupial of. mole, too. Oh, there that, we that go. Sits that sits outside guy. with the... Um, the Dasyuromorphs and the Paramelomorphs as well. So. Okay, that's interesting. So, yeah. what does hypercarnivorous mean? It I mean, so I think it's yeah. quite obvious. <laughs> Good obviously. question, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's but, an animal that's primarily adapted towards eating other animals. Okay. So, there are some like omnivores that where they might eat a bit of meat, they might eat eggs, they might also eat plants and things. This is an animal that's adapted towards basically just eating meat. Cool. So, so, so a snake would be hyper carnivorous. Yeah, I guess you could say. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I guess we don't really talk about the diets of snakes in the same way because they all eat other animals. But I don't know of any herbivorous snakes. No. Um, <laughs> Steve might be able <laughs> to correct me on that. <laughs> so, Mine. Yeah. No. <laughs> they, yeah, pretty, probably the only veggies they eat are the ones in their prey. In so, the prey, yeah. yeah. Mm. So thylacoleo would. We talk about drop bears. If he was alive today, that'd be pretty well a drop Absolutely, bear. Absolutely, yeah. So okay. that was that was the original drop bear. Yeah. So they were around when the first Australians arrived in in this country about fifty thousand years ago, and they were all the evidence suggests that Thylacoleo could have climbed trees and may well have used that to ambush prey. So, yep, we've got a, a big animal that's climbing trees and dropping down on its prey from above. So, so we had leopards. Well, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> actually a really good observation because it, it has been suggested that it filled a leopard-like niche in that it was you know, able to climb. Whether or not it dragged its prey back up into the trees or not, we're not sure. Um, so, But, yeah, certainly that similar kind of niche. Would they have the ability to drag them back up into trees? <sighs> we don't know. Mm. Um, all we can do is basically look at what the skeleton can tell us about what an animal was capable of. And you're never going to be able to figure out everything it could do, um, and you certainly can't figure out what it couldn't do. You can just get a best guess, essentially, of what it was able to do based on comparisons to other animals. It had a pretty amazing jaw, didn't it? Yeah, it sure did. So this is an animal that has basically lost most of its teeth to become specialised to one particular function. So unlike your placental carnivores, it doesn't have great big canines for grabbing flesh. Its canines are really tiny. And instead of having a whole row of molars and premolars that are for cutting bone or crunching up, um, or cutting meat or crunching up bone, it's just got one really big premolar that's about eight centimetres long 
Um, <laughs> and it basically acts like a pair of secateurs for cutting through, we think, meat. So a very strong jewel. Yeah, very, very strong. So some of the research that's been done suggests it was amongst the most or the highest bite forces of any known mammal living or extinct. Wow. And it, and it could climb and it, yep. and it was... I mean, they weren't small either. I mean, we say drop there, but they're a lot bigger than a yeah, koala. Yeah, we're, we're talking about an animal that's probably, you know, the, the fully grown adults are around about 100 kilos. <laughs> and then you can add on as well to the repertoire of scary things... Um, if you think about a lion or a wolf or anything like that, none of them have opposable digits. So if they're grabbing prey, they're doing it with their teeth or just hooking in with claws. But Thylacoleo actually had a really big opposable thumb with a nice big hooked claw on it. So it could have grabbed its prey much more strongly than any of your placental carnivores as well. So like an eagle? Kind of, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they're definitely not out there still. <laughs> I haven't seen any. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's an amazing time. Like that thirty thousand years ago, forty thousand years ago, these these guys were around. Um, <clears throat> we were thinking about them the other night. We were sitting out here, l- listening to the sounds of the bush. We could hear a boobo cow and a banjo frog, and we could hear a koala. <laughs> and I was thinking, what what did, what would it have sounded like here? tens of thousands of years ago when you had some of the megafauna there was even a giant koala and it's a it's a really interesting question because we have so many groups of marsupials that were around relatively recently in the on a geological time scale so only 40,000 years ago but all of these marsupials or many of these marsupials belong to whole families that are now extinct so trying to understand the noises that they could make is actually really challenging because we don't have any modern analogues to test it with. And when you look at marsupials today, generally speaking, most of them are pretty quiet. They don't make a lot of noises. They make a bunch of different growls and grunts and things, um, but they don't tend to be vocal in the same way that many ungulates are, for example. Um, but having said that, there are a whole array of really weird noses in some of the extinct marsupials that suggest that maybe they had adaptations towards different vocalisations. What they might have sounded like, we have absolutely no idea because we don't have any modern analogue to test it with. Makes sense. The koala's a terrifying sounding animal for anyone that's never heard one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like a pig in a tree. Um, the tiger quails, I mean, Sherlock, our tiger quail, in fact, just going back to Thylacolea being, you know, 100 kilos plus, I mean, he's 5.5 kilos and he's a beast. Yep. Um, that's a terrifying animal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, well, yeah, when you think about it, the Australian in the Australian context, we don't have a lot of big carnivores. We don't have those multi-hundred kilogram bears and things wandering around. So our carnivore mammals fauna were, in general, a lot smaller than on many other continents, but at, we've had several rounds of extinctions that have winnowed out all of the larger carnivores. So Thylacoleo would have been the biggest, and then after that was gone, Thylacines would have been the biggest, and then the Thylacines go, are gone, so now we're down to the Tasmanian Devil being the biggest mammalian carnivore native to Australia. And then after that, we've got the Tiger Quoll. So, yeah, it, it really is sort of shrinking down Shrinking down. And when you say thylacine, you're not just talking about the Tasmanian tiger. There were other thylacines. Yeah, there were. And, in fact, that's one of the um, interesting lineages in that the largest member of that lineage was not the one that was most recently alive. There was actually a, a Miocene, so about six to seven million years ago, a species of thylacine which was actually significantly bigger than the Tasmanian tiger that was around when we arrived in Australia. Yeah, I think um, the Tassie tiger is about 35 kilos, and I've read that the, there were some that were like 60, 70 kilos yeah, perhaps. So, and yeah, it would have been a, a bit, fair bit bigger. Maybe not up to 60, but probably close to, yeah, maybe 45, 50. Um, okay. But, Significant. Yeah. I mean, a German shepherd's about 40 kilos, to yeah. give you an idea. Well, that's sort of what I'm sitting here thinking now is like, <laughs> in today, like a thylacoleo would be probably a very successful predator here in Australia with foxes and cats for it to... Yep. And bushwalkers too. So. <laughs> and bushwalkers. Yep. Yep. Backpackers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's such a shame now that you sort of think that they, they could possibly be 
quite successful if they yeah. if they were still around now because well, that's a hundred kilos isn't huge you know it's half it's less than half the size of a lion uh, it probably is about the mm. size of a leopard yeah maybe a bit bigger than a leopard yeah. yeah but that's a really important point that you touch on there that you actually have the larger carnivores controlling numbers of the smaller carnivores as well so mm. in a functioning ecosystem we have a whole cascade effect happening with that and today with our completely impoverished marsupial fauna we have placental carnivores that are filling some of those roles but because they haven't evolved together with the marsupials they're having a terrible effect on the herbivores that are around so we see things like dingoes actually help control cat and fox numbers because they predate those animals as well as the herbivores and so yeah having something like thylacoleo around absolutely would have had an effect on controlling other carnivore numbers as well mm, what a shame. we don't have any clue on why thylacoleo went extinct well it wasn't actually well from what we can tell about the skeleton it wasn't a really fast animal so this isn't a pursuit predator that's going a long distance or running really fast it's probably an ambush predator and if you think about the big marsupials that are still around today like our red and grey kangaroos they're really fast moving and the ones that went extinct some of the short-faced stenuring kangaroos were much heavier bodied and probably much slower moving so what we can extrapolate from that is that maybe thylacoleo was actually adapted to chasing and eating these slower animals and so as they went extinct its main food supply also went extinct Okay, But we can also think about um, the human context of why it might have gone extinct as well. You think about um, African communities today. If there's a lion around, they're not going to happily live side by side with it. And it poses a very real risk to their communities, so they're often going to hunt it. And maybe exactly the same thing was happening in Australia in that in order to reduce risk to themselves... Thylacoleo was targeted. One of the ideas was that it used its big thumb claw to hook joeys out of pouches. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> so it's actually in the literature published. Um, that, <laughs> that might have been a thing, but there's been a lot of speculation. That's someone um, with a twisted mind there. Sure is, yeah. <laughs> so Thylacoleo was first described in 1859 by Sir Richard Owen, and he suggested then that it was supremely adapted to eating meat. But in the hundred years following that there were people who completely disagreed with that, argued that it was a herbivore both based on its ancestry and on the dentition there were people who argued that it was a melon specialist What's that, that mean? Uh, uh, melons? Yeah, for oh, eating melons God, really? So, yeah, <laughs> um, Even though there aren't actually that many large melons in Australia for it to <laughs> eat um, but yeah, there's all kinds of strange ideas that have come out around um, what that dentition might have been adapted to. And part of that wild speculation is because it's so weird looking. There's nothing like it today. So we can't say, oh, yeah, it looks like one of them, so it was probably doing the same thing. Do we know, uh, do we know how many babies they would have had? Probably only one. If we look at most of the larger marsupials that are around today, you know, look, wombats koalas yeah. kangaroos they only ever have one um and it'd be the the really aberrant ones that might might have two so they're not like the it's really only the dazzyurids and the bandicoots and things that have litters of um or larger brood sizes mm. most of the um dipredodontians tend to have one and you might, possums might have two or very occasionally three but generally speaking we're looking at pretty small <laughs> numbers yeah, that's a good point about the babies. Like the, the yeah. Diprotodontia will have one. Like you say, kangaroos occasionally have two. And I, yep. did, I didn't know possums sometimes had three. I think it's it's pretty rare. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can actually remember as a kid a, a ringtail possum near our place had three babies sitting on its back. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know how common that is. So. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, my gliders only ever have one or two, but then you say, like, Dazzy Urids can have... Many, yeah, many. I think they can go ten at least. Some of the species of Dazirids, especially the smaller ones, smaller some ones. Of, yeah. Some of the Dunarts. Uh, yeah. Eastern quolls have thirty babies, but they only have really? six nipples. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so it's the battle to the nipple, a race to the yeah, nipple. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, now you mentioned ringtail possums. Last time you were here, um, you got super interesting after we had already stopped recording. I think we were about to run and grab the um, recording stuff because we were. <laughs> you, were you were telling me about we were looking at the betongs, and you were saying because uh, I think I was I was talking to you about I was clarifying in my mind that betongs, potteroos kangaroos these guys evolved from possums mm-hmm. and you'd said that betongs are let me get this straight that no, ringtail possums are more related to betongs and kangaroos than they are to brush tail possums yeah that's and, right and yet we call them all possums but really that's a very general term isn't it yeah it sure is so basically what we're looking at here is the diversification of possum families probably happened 30, 35 million years ago. So all of those different families of possums that we see around today actually diverged a long time ago in the fossil record. And then within one of those possum families, maybe 30 million, maybe, you know, 27, 28 million years ago, what within one of those possum families, something really weird evolved that became the first early kangaroo. And then from there, they have proliferated and expanded into the hugely diverse group that we know as our kangaroos and betongs and um, potteries today. And the potteries and betongs have maintained a prehensile tail, haven't they? Yeah, so there's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to tell how much of that is a uh, secondarily evolved character and how much of it's been retained. Uh, certainly the early member of the kangaroo or the ancestral kangaroo, if you like, was probably a a small bounding animal Um, so not hopping like kangaroos do today but just sort of crawling around on the rainforest floor maybe Um, and whether or not it had a prehensile tail we don't know wasn't it yeah okay and wasn't it something to do with one of the bones in the feet that prevented that kind of articulation so that was like almost fused so that they could bounce yeah that's what we see in modern kangaroos and it's most highly developed in things like reds and greys um, where those animals are adapted to moving long distances and in that hopping style of locomotion we actually see a lot of stress being put on the ankle joints as you might expect and if you have a ankle that is quite mobile that means you have the potential to roll the ankle when there's lots of stress being put on it so the bones of the ankle of modern kangaroos are adapted towards restricting that movement so that the angle, ankle can't roll. Interesting. And it was only Australia that um, any of the possums evolved into being able to hop like a kangaroo. Yeah. No, nowhere else that, that yeah. occurred. So it's just, yeah, the possum group um, only really occurs in Australia and New Guinea. So the, what we call <laughs> possums in South America are a whole different group compared to what we get in Australia. Uh, possums. So, yeah. so we need a new name, don't we, for possums, because yeah. it's just a bit too general, isn't it? Tree marsupials. Well, then they're noble, because there were thylacines that lived in trees and quolls All, live all in kinds trees. of different things. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So um, thylacoleo is only the end member of a lineage of what we call the thylacoleonids. So that's the family that it belongs to. And they appear in the fossil record in some of the earliest sites that we have, so about 25 million years ago. Uh, in places like Riversley in far north Queensland, uh, but they are much, much smaller. So there's one described only a couple of years ago uh, in a genus called Microleo, and this thing was probably only the size of a small quoll. A little lion. Um, yep. <laughs> so a t- tiny, tiny little thing, uh, and again, probably living almost exclusively in trees rather than being able to climb, but mainly living on the ground. Uh, and then there's another genus called Wackaleo, <laughs> uh, which is a slightly larger one as well. Um, and then within, even within the genus Thylacoleo, there was an earlier uh, species called Thylacoleo hili before Thylacoleo carnifex, the marsupial lion, came along. So there's actually a, fa- a fair few different species known. They've never been a really diverse group, so we haven't seen lots and lots of species alive at the same time, but they've actually got quite a long fossil history. It's very interesting. So your job is to like be a detective and piece together how they evolved and, and, and what they did and how they survived just by looking at just fragments of bone. Pretty much, yeah. So one of the things, there's a whole range of different things we do within paleontology, but one of my specialties is what we call functional morphology. 
and that's where we look at all the different lumps and bumps on bones and we figure out what they mean. So when we look at an animal or a mammal, we basically all have the same muscles. We don't have a whole suite of different muscles to, for example, uh, a cow or a sheep or a dog. We've all got pretty much the same muscles. The arrangement is different and where they attach is different and how highly developed different muscles are changes, but we've got the same groups. So we can actually look at extinct animals and we know, based on a lump on the bone, which muscle was attaching there. So then we can actually look at what that muscle does and we can start to figure out the function of that animal. So if we've got an animal that has a big deltoid crest, we know it's got big deltoid muscles. Um, Or the biceps attachment for flexing the elbow might be really large, so we know that it had strong flexion capability in the elbow. So they're the kind of clues that we use by looking at the bones to try and extrapolate what an animal could do. So when you say Thylacoleo perhaps had the most powerful bite of any mammal um, you're telling that obviously just from the bones yeah so yeah we've only got the bones left there aren't any cases of soft tissue preservation of thylacoleo um, and there probably won't be because we don't have the right kind of um, preservation preservational environments Um, about the only place in Australia where we do see occasional things like skin impressions is Lake Calabona uh, out in uh, east of the Flinders Ranges in South Australia uh, and we only see a few sort of foot pad impressions and things out there but there's no thylacoleo known from that area. So. The Indigenous people of Australia have a spoken history that passed down for multi-generations. Did they have any stories about thylacoleo? It's a really interesting challenge trying to tease out thylacoleo in stories of the dreaming and, and what we have available in the Indigenous heritage. So um, the Biliwarana people from uh, the Flinders Ranges have an animal that they call Indukuli, which is that as far as um, we can piece together from what I've done talking to them was Thylacoleo. Um, but what it did, where it lived, um, changes in different Indigenous stories around Australia. Uh, It's also potentially present in cave art, but a lot of cave art is um, fairly vague in its um, anatomical features, so interpretation of that is also highly speculative as well. Um, Based on what we know about where and when thylacoleo occurred and when humans arrived in Australia, there was almost definitely a significant period of overlap, maybe 10,000 years, maybe 20,000 years, between when humans arrived and when thylacoleo went extinct. So it makes sense that it would have been incorporated into their stories. Mm. I mean, we were, saying, could, sorry, no, okay. we were saying earlier that some of their artwork is hard to date as well. Yeah, so that's an, another challenge, is that it's nearly impossible to date a lot of this artwork. Um, so we can group different styles of cave art or um, this uh, art based on um, how similar they are and so because it hasn't it's not just a matter of all rock art from the last 50,000 years is the same there are clearly distinct um, styles used at different periods so if a painting or a drawing is done in a specific style then we can get some idea of how old it is Um, but in terms of being able to actually date it absolutely, it's very rare that you would have the right kind of um, preservation or depositional environment to be able to get anywhere near that. Working with all these long extinct animals, does it make you look at today's animals, like things like quolls and things, which, you know, like in South Australia they're extinct. I mean, we've reintroduced some at the Flinders, but... Does it make you look at these animals and just think, God, you know, what can we do to save some of these animals that are still around? Absolutely. So paleontologists, um, there's a famous quote, and I can't remember who it was by, um, Ernst Mayer maybe, who said basically paleontologists are the custodians of the only record of animals and plants untouched by humans. (laughs) And so in working with uh, these megafaunal deposits, particularly the more recent ones, we probably have more of an appreciation than anyone for the diversity that was around in Australia prior to human arrival. And 
we also are chronicling in what we do the disappearance of those species. So I personally have an absolutely a huge value and appreciation of the complexity of the Australian fauna and I think conserving it and preserving what's left is extremely important. So yeah, things like the reintroduction of quolls in um, the Flinders Ranges are really encouraging stories but at the end of the day it's going to come down to how we actually approach management of all the invasive species that is going to feed into what we can save of the remainder of the marsupial fauna. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, I, I, I look at like the same way with the plants and um, the insects and the whole the whole ecosystem. It's such a unique place. Like uh, Christopher Daniels was on last year and he talked about the Adelaide Hills and the Kangaroo Island being one of ten biodiversity hotspots in the country. And it just makes you look around very differently and go, whoa, this is... I mean, and that's in Australia. Like, Australia is a very diverse country. Mm-hmm. Um, so what a, what a special place that we live in. And, you know, very few people go about their days and consider how amazingly diverse this country is. I, mean, I think we all, we all love it to a degree, but, you know, very few people appreciate how diverse it is. But it was far more diverse, and it's really hard to get your head around what it would have been like. I mean, you know... Uh, th- those early indigenous people that came here just imagine seeing Australia untouched by mm-hmm. by humans at all it would have been a crazy time because I mean we're talking about the marsupial lion but there were other giants on the landscape yeah there sure were there's a whole whole range of different um, species in fact more than 90% of the large mammal fauna have gone extinct since human arrival 90% um, yep. So megafauna is 35 kilograms or above. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bit of an arbitrary line in the sand kind of thing. So we tend to say 35 kilos or an animal that was more than 30% larger than its living relatives because there are actually some large, small animals, if that makes any sense, that went extinct as well. For example, there was a megafaunal skink. Oh, okay. <laughs> so a giant sleepy lizard that probably weighed two or three kilos. Wow, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it actually had spikes on its um, scales. Wow. So, or, or kind of horned uh, appendages. So it was uh, basically a, a, the tank of sleepy lizards, if you like. Um, and there are, there was a slightly larger Tasmanian devil. Um, than the ones that are around today. So even within the groups of smaller animals, there is a, a often a larger version that went extinct. There was a larger echidna uh, that went extinct as well. So, so, so that skink would still be classed as megafauna because it's yeah, the in this yeah in this plus of, kind of yeah, categorization. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so that's why in more recent years that definition of megafauna has changed to the thirty percent bracket as well because it allows us to fully encompass the diversity and also that diversity loss that we see with the extinction of the megafauna. Wow. So big things go first. Yep. Uh, And generally speaking, the bigger you are, the slower you are to breed and the more um, likely you are to be exposed to environmental changes, detrimental environmental changes mm. and, and the effects of those. So, Yeah, OK, that makes sense. Um, we were talking before about um, why Thylacalia could have gone extinct. Do you think the fire stick farming, like things like that are quick, that could hop away from the fires, um, Thylacalia wouldn't have been quick? Big, bulky animal like that? Yeah, we'd, that's a, the fire stick farming is a tricky one because... Um, it's a mosaic approach, but we also don't know how widely employed it was and it, whether it was used in all environments. Um, because it's employed in a mosaic rather than just a whole area, it's unlikely to have had a direct effect on killing thylacoleo, for example. So even if the thylacoleos in one area were killed off, we're only talking by fire, we're only talking about a small area. So other ones could move back in and breed in other areas and that kind of thing. The thing about fire stick farming and the impact that it might have had on megafauna is that over time it would have selected for fire dependent species and against fire vulnerable species of plants. And so any fauna that is dependent on those fire vulnerable um, species is going to disappear from that landscape over time as well. 
Okay, so it's that flow and effect. Yeah. Okay. And it's really, really hard to measure that because what we would need is a pollen record from lots of different sites around Australia from the period before humans arrived and immediately after so we could look at that vegetation change. So much work involved in, in all of this stuff. Like We're just having this casual conversation about stuff, but the amount of hours that yourself and your colleagues put into this work is phenomenal. Absolutely. Well, you've got to remember that paleontology really encompasses all of the sciences prior to you know, history, so prehistoric times. So there's, it's not just about understanding the biology. It incorporates the geology as well. There's physics in terms of understanding dating methods and, and how we can learn about that. There's chemistry and understanding isotopes and what they can tell us about past environments, past climates, what animals we're eating, all that kind of thing. Um, so really, it's a, it is a multidisciplinary field, and there are thousands of different specialisations within that, both in terms of which science you're working in, but then also which group of animals or plants or in, you know, invertebrates. There are people who work on ancient bacteria or, or microbes and things as well and, and understanding them. And then there's even things like ancient DNA, so looking into what that can tell us about understanding different plant and animal communities. Is it a field that um, you're finding more and more young people are getting involved in? Um, I think paleontology has always held... Uh, a particular interest to kids you know, all the kids love dinosaurs, go through a dinosaur phase of some description um, pretty much, most of them grow out of it I didn't uh, but um, it's a you know, the, these fantastic animals that were around really capture the imagination you know, they're, quite often they're in the same kind of realm as dragons and things in terms of just these unimaginable fantastic beasts that were around prior to human arrival or, or in times past and so certainly um, it has a lot of appeal but when it comes to the study later on I think that if an appreciation of the Australian fauna and how unique it is is in, instilled in kids in primary school and in high school, then they're probably much more likely to come into something like paleontology and where they want to learn more about that diversity that Australia did have. So. And you've got to have a good academic <coughs> mind like yourself. Well, yes and no. So one of the okay. things that we're actually looking at at Flinders now um, with the new degree that we've just um, introduced this year is the opportunity to follow different career pathways within paleontology. So academia is one of the things that you can do, but then there are also things like science communication, so bridging that gap between academics and the general public in terms of how we actually go about communicating the research, exactly like we're doing in this podcast. We're science to communicators, Steve. <laughs> I knew that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Bloody knew that all along. <laughs> all these years. All these years. <laughs> um, and another aspect is the art and recreation and reconstruction side of things. So that virtual design, looking at how we go about taking the bones and recreating something that people can actually see and what, it, what these animals might have looked like. So within this new degree, we have different electives where students can actually go down different pathways depending on which aspects they're interested in. Oh, cool. What's that degree so, called? It's a Bachelor of Science Paleontology. So it's actually Australia's first full paleontology degree. Wow, Fantastic. that's great. Yeah. Right here at Flinders Uni. Yeah. Excellent. What, what, what do you think about the ideas when people talk about cloning the thylacine, bringing, bringing some of these extinct animals back. Is any of that even possible? Uh, it's, I think it's possible now, and certainly in the future it will be um, achievable. Really? Yeah, absolutely. For things like thylacines and that kind of thing that are only recently dead. But what we have to remember is how terrible we are at looking after animals that are still alive today. Uh, if we can't even demonstrate that we can keep a carnivore, a carnivore population Healthy. from going extinct today, what hope have we got of actually bringing one back that is already extinct? I agree, but if we could still try with the skink, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so yeah. Please. for things like that, um, so what we have to remember here is 
in order to clone it or actually bring it back, we need the full nuclear genome. So we've got to get all the DNA, basically, and then we need a host that is going to bring that embryo to term that is relatively closely related to these animals. And if we don't have that full genome, then we can make a best guess based on the closest living relatives about how those genes might have been expressed, about what that code might have been. But if we're doing that, we're making a new animal. We're not bringing back an old one. Mm, okay. So things like bringing back dinosaurs is never going to happen because we're not going to get a full genetic um, spectrum for these animals. Jesus. But what we may well be able to do with our understanding of genetics and gene expression and that kind of thing is build something from scratch that, to all intents and purposes, looked and acted like, for example, a Tyrannosaurus rex. Okay. So Michael Crichton was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all been... yeah, no DNA out of Amber, Or was he? <laughs> or was he? So... <laughs> oh. yeah. um, it's interesting you say that if we are going to bring these some of these animals back, we've got to look at how we... A current, like you know, how we treat wild animals and, and preserve them. Yeah. What about bringing it back simply for captivity? I know that's kind of frowned upon quite often, but we talk about. I love your thoughts. Conservation <laughs> through domestication. Like I, I mean, Absolutely. we all prefer seeing things in the wild, but that's out of our control to a degree. I can control the three acres I live on, and I can try to inspire other people to care about the environment and keep their cats, all that stuff. But, but I mean. You know, we can keep things in... There, there are great keepers out there that look after quolls and whatever else, so... Yeah. Well, I mean, we're both in that same mindset in that one of the best ways to conserve the Australian fauna is to encourage people actually keeping them as pets and, you know, giving an idea that they are valuable and make great pets is the first step to actually instilling a sense of value of the Australian fauna in the general populace. So, sure, we might be able to bring thylacines back and keep them as pets, and, and maybe that would work down the line. I mean, I'm sure you'd get rich people all over the world who would be happy to say that they've got a, a thylacine for a pet. Yep. Um, but in terms of whether that relates to an ecosystem health, I don't think that that's really contributing to that. You know, it's just a novelty rather than actually trying to restore Australian ecosystems. It, it, it so really it's a is. Yeah. Different ball game. A novelty is a reason, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, because my hope is that. Um, I mean, let's say if somebody did keep a pet thylacine back in the day, and there was a captive population of thylacines from you know since they went extinct in 1936, but we could never put them back in the wild because of whatever factors those factors may one day change. They mm -hmm. may find an offshore island or, you know, that kind of stuff can can evolve. We may become, in the future, diehard conservationists and reduce our population. We can hope. We can hope. <laughs> no. I hope we do. Um, or it may be out of our hands and there'll be a cataclysm and, and um, that'll make us more <laughs> in tune with the environment. And those captive thylacines will still be there and who knows. Yeah. Well, I mean... One of the things that I'd like to think we're slowly getting our head around as a population in Australia is learning from the Indigenous people in how to manage our ecosystems. So they went through exactly the same thing that we did in that they came to a new environment that they were completely unfamiliar with. There was a period of unrest in which a whole bunch of animals died and then some kind of equilibrium was reached. They learned how that ecosystem worked, how to manipulate it, how to manage it in a way that meant that it can continue to thrive. Now, because of the technology that we've had available, we've had a much bigger impact in a much shorter period of time. Um, but there's still a lot of Indigenous knowledge and there's still a lot of science and knowledge of how different ecosystems work that can be applied to us understanding and managing the ecosystems that we've got today. And I think learning from the trial and error of indigenous populations and, and what they've gone through is the next step in us being better able to manage and function in, in an Australian context. And I think, or maybe hope, that we're sort of reaching that point now 
we're in that yeah. point now that we're understanding that and we're understanding the environment a lot more now and we're getting to that point that the indigenous people got to you know, we're we can save in it as well. Now. We can Hopefully hope it's not too late. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it follows exactly the same um, trajectory as this native animals as pets thing. We have to get value in using Australian natives for food as well, rather than all of the introduced things. So you know, all of the European crops that came with us were put in because that's what Europeans were familiar with. Mm. But there are actually viable native alternatives that could be used. Uh, in many of these cases and so if we can actually get the Australian populace as a whole enthusiastic about eating native Australian stuff then we can actually go towards restoring ecosystem and some kind of ecosystem health plants and animals you mean yeah Yeah, absolutely because I mean it's really important to remember that you cannot have animal health without first starting out with the plants so and a whole ecosystem is basically dependent on the plant health you need that initial biomass and biodiversity of plants for any of the animals to actually be able to survive. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, that plants don't get in oh, I love it. I <laughs> love everything it's about what you just said. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Put it much better than you do. <laughs> you does, yeah. <laughs> um, no. You say yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in the scientific community. When do you think the government's going to start listening to it? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, oh, here we go. Well, here we go. I mean... The problem is that we take a lot, as a society, we take a lot of cues from America in how we want to go about running our government and um, how we go about valuing and and structuring our society. And as we know, in recent times, there has been a growing mistrust of facts in the American society that is growing outside of us. Or coming into Australia and that kind of thing as well. So the absolute most crucial thing is education. Getting kids to understand what science is, what the scientific method is, and why it is important and why it can be trusted as well. And once we have that general populace understanding what science is telling us, then we can move forward in terms of how that is incorporated. So it's the future generations of... Um, of governments that are going to make the change is that what you mean yeah pretty we're much we're screwed so. now but um, we're well in a few years it's it's all about how these educated kids are voting as well and they're yeah, going to okay. make yeah. a change in mm-hmm. that um so once we've actually got a government that values in some way our our country our our land mass and and the animals and plants in it i think we'll be doing much better another key thing would be to actually have a um, government cabinet where the each appointed minister actually has some qualification in their <laughs> field that they're working in. Well, yeah. I should write that down. That's a brilliant one. Here too. <laughs> it seems so obvious when yeah. you say it, though, doesn't it? Mm. It, 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 it? So actually have an mm. environment minister who has a degree in some kind of environment-related discipline would be a good start, for It'd example. be a massive start. I think it's like... Uh, maybe I'm the real massive optimist, but... I think that is going to naturally happen. Well, it's happening in Canada already, Mm. um, but it's dependent on the leader and that people are voting for and what their priorities are. Um, We also need to, I think, move away from the career politician. You know, a, a degree in politics doesn't actually qualify you to take up any of these ministries. It qualifies you to be a politician, to know how to play the system, to get votes when in fact we need people who are secondarily coming into politics after having a career in something that they can actually bring to the table that's going to help managing the country as well. That's a very good point. Yeah. We should get off politics. (laughs) Well, we need to get a... We need to grill a politician. (laughs) Do you mean literally? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we can do that. Uh, No? Okay. (laughs) We won't won't do that. Um, (laughs) What... uh, Have you got any special projects going at the moment? A couple of different things. Like, we're focusing a lot on the... um, on the teaching the new degree degree, and and what we're doing with that. Uh, But we've got two main sites that we're working at the moment. One of those is Lake Calabona. So this is a pretty young site, um, possibly even um, post-dating human arrival. We're not really sure yet. Um, 
but we're getting a whole suite of paleobiological information out of that between fossil trackways, skin impressions, hair impressions, uh, relatively complete skeletons, some of them with pouch young. Um, we're getting windows into different species that we haven't seen before. And then the other area or suite of sites that we're working on um, are much, much older, about 25 million years old. And so they're giving us a really early window into the evolution of the modern Australian fauna, both in terms of the mammals, the reptiles and the birds. So we've got really key, and I can't tell you much about these specimens because they haven't been published yet. There's another future uh, episode. <laughs> yeah. But there are really early and really interesting members of a whole range of different animal lineages which are extremely informative in telling us how these different groups of animals evolved. Wow. So the landscape wouldn't have looked too different, but the fauna would have been very different. Well, uh, in sort of 50,000 years ago. Yeah, when, um, when humans first arrived. Yeah, yeah, so we're probably looking at a significantly higher biomass across the continent, so more trees, more understory, um, and there has been a big drying out of the central Australian area. So it's some research that was published a couple of years ago suggested that the Great Lakes, so Lake Eyre, Lake Gairdner, Lake Frome, Lake Torrens, were probably... Um, fresh as recently as 46,000 years ago and there was a catastrophic drying period about then that has basically led through to the really dry interior that we've got today but you can imagine if you had you know hundreds of or even thousands of square kilometers of lakes right throughout central Australia it's going to make for a pretty different environment to what we see out there today. Right. So that drying, would that have coincided with an ice age? Like when? No, this is, no? well, this is during the last ice age. Okay. So the, what we call the glacial period. Um, but the last glacial period um, was most intense about 23 to 20,000 years ago. Um, so we don't know how much this was affected by different climatic regimes during the glacial period. Uh, we also don't really know whether or not what was observed in the drying of these lakes was cyclical because we have to remember that there wasn't just one ice age there's been an ice age every hundred thousand years or so uh, right back through the last eight hundred thousand years and then prior to that it was a forty thousand year cycle um, going back at least a million and a half years so we've had big climatic fluctuations through most of the Pleistocene period in Australia and during the glacial periods, what we call, you know, ice age, we think, okay, well, that's going to mean there's more water around because ice is made of water. But in fact, we don't see big ice sheets in Australia. We don't really see glaciers at all, except up in New Guinea. Uh, and it, it's actually a really arid period for Australia. So the, those glacial periods are dry periods for us. That leads into my next question. Now that the Earth's getting warmer, are we going to get wetter? Um, there's a, I'm not a climate scientist, so uh, it's going to be arm-waving answering this question for you, but um, there will be more extreme weather events, but that doesn't necessarily mean higher rainfall. Some areas will get higher rainfall, some areas will get less rainfall. Um, we might see the monsoon moving further south, which might mean we get more of that summer rain, but when you tie that in with the general climate of extreme weather events so more heat waves that kind of stuff we, it means that even if the rainfall does increase for us it might actually be coming at the wrong time during periods where the evaporation is higher so the net amount of water coming into the ecosystem could still decrease okay so even with increased rainfall so we won't have fresh water lakes again potentially we don't i guess climate's an extremely variable subject to try to predict but it's just interesting i just my simplistic mind goes well we're getting warmer now I, i'm still blown away by the fact and we went over this in the last podcast we did with you as well that there's a glacier in new guinea yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know that's near the equator that's <laughs> strange <laughs> it's just yeah, strange yeah. i guess when it's high enough mm. it keeps cold yeah so. yeah no, I, I just yeah, my simple mind thinks like if we if we 
get warmer, we get more rain, we could become tropical and crocodiles will move back down here and in the well, next Well, that years. would be the, the ideal. Um, <laughs> but that also, you know, means that we need to have vegetation able to freely move and grow around rather than being cleared and you, so that land, land's being used for agriculture. That was the know, great so. point that you made last time was, um, yeah, the climate's warming and, and in theory things adapt, but everything's islandized now so things haven't got the ability to migrate yeah absolutely um, that's one of our biggest problems that we'll be facing with looking at long-term species movement during this period of warming yeah i, I really like that point and I've, and I've used that a lot in my talks thank you uh, <laughs> <laughs> um mate Thank you so much. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Anything that um, we haven't covered that um, to do with what you what you're doing? Um, I'll add one little bit about coming all the way back around to Thalakaleo, where we started. Um, in our most recent study, um, one of the interesting findings for me, anyway, was actually looking at the tail of this animal. So, because different parts of Thalakaleo have been found at different periods in time it wasn't until about 2007 that the complete specimen was found and it hasn't been fully described until this most recent paper came out and we looked at the tail and what that told us about the animal and what we found was that thylacleo was actually moving something like a tasmanian devil so it was quite stiff backed stiff backed and um, so not really flexible it's not moving like a, a feline or something like that so you think about how uh, a big cat moves as it's chasing down its prey and that kind of thing. Lots of flexion in the back. We're not seeing any of that. Uh, and the tail of Thylacaleo actually curled upward. So I read that. Sticking up in the air. And made me think of a number. Yeah, well, we'd, we don't really know what it was for. And we were told by the reviewers of our paper that the ideas that we had put in were too speculative so we had to remove them out. But one of the possibilities was that it was used in communication. Um, there have to be a, a relatively limited number of things that it could have been used for. You know, you think about a tail being up in, right up in the air. It's not being used for balance if it's sort of curling right up. Um, and, and so maybe it was a communication thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no baby thylacoleo fossils. Well, from... This, so the, the two sites that we looked at in this study were um, a site on the Nullarbor Caves where a complete um, thylacoleo specimen was found and a cave called Komatsu Cave, uh, which was from Henschke's Quarry in Narakort, where 11 different thylacoleo skeletons were found. And none of them were complete, but some of them were relatively complete. But they were all different ages, ranging from an animal that was probably still in the pouch right up to fully oh, adult okay. animals. So we do actually have um, some idea of how it changed as it grew, and that may well be the next area of research for Thylacoleo is actually someone working on studying how it changed as it, as it grew. Um, and as it aged, did I read it right that the caudal vertebrae at the proximal end fused together as it uh, got so, older. Yeah, so the, the sacral vertebrae, um, which are the bits that articulate with the pelvis, are usually all fused. And the number of vertebrae in the sacrum varies between different animal groups. Kangaroos only have two. Um, something like a hippopotamus has six or seven, I think. Um, but in the case of thylacoleo, where we can look at it through time... We see that the young ones have two fused vertebrae and then the sort of sub-adults have three and then the mature adults have four vertebrae fused into the sacrum. And, yeah, that's going to affect um, the way that the muscles of the lower back um, function because it's all about... That's where that kind of pelvis area is where they all anchor. So a bigger attachment area for those muscles is going to mean a stronger um, sort of flexion of the tail, for example. Interesting. And would it give better balance as well then, is that? Um, but it depends. So quite often the balance is related to tail function. So then you look at more things like how long is the tail, how flexible is the tail, mm -hmm. what is it doing with it. In the case of thylacoleo, um, 
the tail might have been used as a bit of a prop to free up the hands. So not that it's tripoding like a kangaroo, but more like a um, Tasmanian devil in that it kind of just sits on the ground and helps it balance a little bit to free up its hands while it's manipulating prey or you know, tearing apart a carcass or something like that. Mm. Holding onto a branch while it's on a tree. That's what I like, I like the thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see spider monkeys, they look so yeah, relaxed right. in a precarious position, but they've got their tail hitched onto the tree. Mm. That's, that must be handy. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Like There's it. actually a lot of different um, methods used by different marsupials to balance in trees. So if we look at um, ringtail possums, they've got the prehensile tail where they can actually grab onto a branch. Uh, brushtail possums use more of a sort of balancing pole kind of thing. Tree kangaroos have a tail that basically just hangs down and acts as a, a, a big weight to stop you overbalancing one way or the other. That reminds um, me of the so yellow-footed rock wallabies yeah. we had in the lounge room at the moment. <laughs> they, <laughs> well, they, they, um, they were very, they're very closely related too, aren't they? They split yep. something like four million years ago. But I think yep. seven million years ago they diverged from tree kangaroos. Yeah, so well, tree kangaroos are actually a uh, quite recent evolution or evolutionary group. Um, so they, it's not a case that that kind of climbing possum-like thing has been retained the whole way through kangaroos. They've secondarily gone back up into the trees. And that's really fascinating from a functional morphology point of view because we look at an animal that's adapted to hopping then going back up into a climbing environment and changing that hopping morphology and adapting it towards a, a climbing thing again. So it's, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it reminds me of, like, life came out of the ocean and went, here we are, we're on land, this is great, and then let's go become a whale. What, yep, why'd you bother? Yeah. Why'd you do it? <laughs> Make your mind up. Um, <laughs> they didn't know they wanted to become yeah. a whale, though, at the point when Maybe. they came out, Adrian. Maybe they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all to do with... Um, niche space in an environment and and what opportunities there are to evolve into different areas so if there's a niche that's not been occupied or if something's gone extinct then that creates a bit of a va ecological vacuum that other species can evolve or radiate into so the question there is okay when tree kangaroos evolved what was it in the trees that disappeared that then allowed them to expand and i don't think we really have an answer for that yet that's interesting, yeah. I mean, because the possums came, some of them came out of the trees and turned into, as we were saying, the hoppy, the hoppy things, the kangaroos and betongs, and that was uh, probably to do with the drying out of the continent. Well, that was prior to the drying out, so we're talking okay. about a period that was still um, the, called the um, Miocene Climatic Optimum, which was a big greenhouse period uh, during the early Miocene so we're talking 20-odd you know, million years ago, where rainforest was extensive right throughout Australia. We see rainforest in central Australia at that time. So we're probably looking at a, a period of very large biomass and, you know, and big diversity as well. That's when they started coming out of the trees? Well, that's, that's when they, um, the period that the early kangaroos evolved, yeah. Okay. Um, now, for some reason, over Christmas I had a bit of spare time and I, I lose myself in Google and start looking up, oh, what's the biggest this, what's the smallest that? Um, Parasiathrium, am I saying that correctly? I don't even know what that is. I'm probably saying it incorrectly. You would know it. It's the <laughs> largest terrestrial mammal that ever lived, that distant relative of rhinoceros. Oh, uh, yeah, so a lot of the rhinos did get um, really, really big. And that's one of the interesting um, contrast between the Australian mammal evolutionary story and the other continents and the placental mammals is a lot of the placental mammals were actually at their biggest during the Eocene, so 50 million years ago. Um, so we had a whole bunch of um, different groups, both the, yeah, so the rhino were significantly larger, had a whole range of different really weird looking horns and all kinds of things. Um, there were titanotheres and a whole range of different, um, you know, things related to giraffes and camels and things like that that were really big. Um, and for whatever reason, they actually got smaller and then we see the increases in size associated with the drying out and in the Pleistocene and the Ice Ages as well. Okay. 
Yeah, this guy was around over 20 million years ago, but he was... They reckon he weighed between 15 and 20 tonnes. That's all. Let's Pretty bring those animal. back. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what's going to... You might have trouble that one um, <laughs> encouraging people to keep them as pets, though. Yeah. <laughs> Destroy your garden, wouldn't it? A 20-ton rhino. <laughs> And on that note, um, <laughs> oh, Aaron, always a pleasure, mate. Thanks so much. That was um, great. Steve, did you want to? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done enough today. <laughs> yeah. I'm reluctant to turn this thing off because I know that as soon as we do, we'll all relax and say something that Aaron will be fascinated again yeah. and he'll say stuff. And, and I love the yeah. way you make us understand things and that is great. It may, oh, it, thank you. Like, it's something that I don't know a lot of, paleontology, dinosaurs, etc even though I'm a reptile man. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you, you make me want to go out and learn it, which is great. Yeah. And I'm glad Flinders are doing that. Yeah, so am I. Cool it's a really too. good place to work. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Fantastic, Thanks, mate. guys. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And thanks for listening.